Hello everyone and welcome back to another Throwback Thursday. I think everything is working this time. Of course, we're in the new studio. Things are, are being tested out and whatnot, some new equipment. We even had some, we had a screen and a, a cam link device, which is what turns like the camcorder feed readable by a computer uh, burn up yesterday. So that was fun. We're testing some new, new pieces of the equipment. So we'd love to know how we look and sound, make sure everything is working. You can see we have sound panels still on the ground and whatnot. We're gonna be totally redoing the backdrop. If you haven't been following us this week, we moved. So we're in a brand new studio. And of course, Steven is gone this week, uh, leaving, leaving the move to all of us that stayed back. But today we're gonna be looking or throwing back to one of my favorite games at this point, the Middle Earth CCG from the 90s. This is a game that we featured, I think this is the third time since the pandemic stream started. And it's one I can't get away from. When Steven's gone, I, I definitely like coming back to this because it's a throwback, but also I don't necessarily want to explore new throwback games when he's not here, because that makes it where you know conversations on the podcast and stuff aren't going to make as much sense. So I'm going to check in with chat. How's everyone doing out there? And how are we looking and sound? I just want to make sure everything is working before we dive into this. Also saw uh, Hannah watching, my sister-in-law. Hope you're doing well. What up, B. Chris? I like the, the little uh, let's go images that you shared there. Ryan saying, I'm sad I never got to see the store before you moved to the new one. Yeah, it's worth mentioning. So we actually moved to uh, more, it is retail technically, but it's it's more of an office space. Uh, and we're, we're actively, we've been working for a couple of years on the, a concept for a new version of our store. We're super excited about it. That was supposed to be uh, this year was when we were supposed to upgrade and move to uh, the new concept of a store that we've been working on for a while. And obviously 2020 had different plans, so we didn't think it made sense to, to, to try to open a store right now. Mr. B. Figaro saying, I wonder which other game group's gonna show up today. Any Crokinole people back? Uh, so if you weren't with us yesterday, it was one of the craziest things that I've seen. Some uh, very popular YouTuber, I think millions of subscribers, was doing kind of a, uh, I, I won't say a parody, but a, a comedic take on like a Crokinole match. Crokinole's a, a tabletop game that is actually, I played a decent amount of back in the day at the old store. And it's kind of a dexterity game, uh, super fun. But all of a sudden in the middle of the stream, we had hundreds and hundreds of different people who had no idea what, what, who we are or what we're playing. We were doing Ashes, uh, just getting <laughs> dumped into our stream and they were just confused and asking a lot of questions, but it was hilarious and uh, it, was, it was really funny. I, I promised them that, if, uh, that at some point we play Crokin on the stream, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Sean saying, eager to see the new incarnation of your space. Yeah, me too. Um, we've been, the, the previous store, if you've seen pictures of it, we, we moved or opened there in, uh, I think it was like April, end of April of 2015. And so we were technically, you know, coming up with the plans and how we wanted to build that out back in 2014. And that was uh, a, almost half of our company's life ago. And so we've learned a lot since then. A lot has changed in the environment of tabletop and also just uh, our understanding of what, what we want to be and what we want to, uh, as a company and what we want out of a store. So I'm particularly excited because I think, uh, you know, as you do things over and over, you, you learn a lot and you hopefully get better at them, kind of like um, hoping happens here with the Middle Earth CCG, but uh, I'm, I'm super excited for what we're, what we're cooking up. Kai saying, Canada represent, what's up? Something I was doing in the pandemic streams early on was checking in and seeing where people are watching from. I'm curious for people watching this because this is the, Third time we stream Middle Earth CCG. Not exactly new. Uh, who here has played? Who here has watched our previous streams? Uh, and who here is interacting with the Middle Earth CCG for the very first time? Lassie, I think it's how you say your name. If that's wrong, let me know. It says, ugh, you just got me into yet another game. I just bought Crisis Protocol. I don't feel bad about that. It's a really good game, especially if you're Looking for a miniatures game where there's less models on the table than like a classic war game uh, And those are also just great models. So I'm, I'm super excited to see what they do with that game fun game great models and X-Men's coming out So how can you how can you deny Hermanson played and watched? Cam saying I played way back when it came out man. I really wish I, I had been Around and, and been able to have been active when that was happening Kai saying I've watched every middle or CCG stream of yours so far <clears throat> That's awesome. Jan saying, I watched very briefly, but I'm basically new to it. Well, welcome. I'll be uh, doing some, the, the plan today is I'm gonna do some deck building and I'm very interested in uh, what's called dunking the ring, which is uh, the, the last deck I built was Aragorn and Arwen becoming king and queen. Gandalf was the wizard. And 
this time I'm, we'll see. I'm going to go through the characters and see what calls to me. But essentially, there's a dunk the ring strategy, which you can win the game by doing this. And you take the ring to Mordor and throw it in Mount Doom. Uh, how exactly that works, we'll work through mechanically in a little bit. But I'm going to be building a deck, and then I've actually put together a, a way to play this game solo that I'll continue uh, experimenting with. The last stream we did was me kind of uh, playing that live for the first time. Learned a lot, had a lot of really great input from the stream. In fact, I just realized as I said that that I didn't grab the dice that I need. Uh, so I'm going to do that in a minute, but we'll, we'll come back around. Ryan Roberson, I've watched your previous streams and bought a bunch of cards now, but I haven't played more than messing around yet. I definitely, uh, I'll say building a deck for the first time, or at least the way I'm playing solo is uh, normally in a deck you have your free people's cards and then your like minion side shadows cards. I don't know the proper terms. I've played too many Lord of the Rings card games. Uh, but in the solo mode, I basically built decks for every type of region. In the, in the game, there's these different region types like forests and what, or wilderness and that kind of stuff. And so as you're traveling around, you have these threats that are popping out that make sense. But normally, those threat cards would be in your deck. And you know, you'd shuffle up and they'd be all mixed in. So again, today, I'm actually just building the free people side of the deck. And the whole solo format is is something I built to kind of like just be able to build a deck and test it without having to like have other people to play with. Obviously, we're in a pandemic and isolation and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's it's just the way that I can play this right now. I, I picked it up finally. It was a game I've been eyeing for a long time. I would see these old, you can see, I'll, I'll grab this book. Uh, this old boxes, booster boxes at Gen Con um, that had this Middle Earth logo on it. And I was always interested in it. Because the art is also pretty fantastic. Like, let me uh, let me find a good piece of art to pull up to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, Bryce, can you pull up Glamdring? This is a, it's not actually a, a crazy piece of art. It's just a, you'll see the style very quickly. Um, I think someone described it really well in the last stream we did, which was. It's the difference between like digital art and then art that's actually painted. I think a lot of this is super old art that was made like physically, like someone painted it, and then now we're getting the digital versions in this game. You can't can't not love that Gandalf art. I, I'm glad you pulled that up. I mean, it's just like that's the the style of this. Uh, but I would see it at Gen Con, and I would uh, you know never necessarily get it. But then finally, they had these challenge decks. It's like this brick of ten different decks. It's five different wizard decks, so it's like Saruman and uh, Palando and Radagast and Gandalf and Alatar, I think, is the last one. And there's a pre-built deck with each of those, and then there's actually five Nazgul. Uh, like the, there's a Witch King with uh, a deck, and you can play that side of the fence as well, apparently. I haven't done that yet, but I'm excited to get there. Same with, like, there's Fallen Wizards, where you can, like, play it. There's a lot going on. It was the 90s, and they didn't really have any uh, precedent rules. But I saw the challenge decks finally pop up on ebay it was a good deal i bought them got them over the holidays and then i was super excited i got all my stuff organized and was reading this uh wizard's companion which is kind of like the old school it reminds me of those if you played video games in the 90s uh something that was very common were strategy guides and this is back before the internet was was what it is today and ultimately you know you buy a book for a video game or for whatever and it would just give you uh the rules and how it works and how the game works and a bunch of tips and recommendations and you know talk about various levels and how to beat it and stuff so i, I read through this book and i read the rules and like it, the rules are actually surprisingly less complicated than they appear uh, but you just have to be able to like walk through it and so anyways started getting into it then the pandemic hit and then it was one of our early throwback streams so if you're brand new that that first video we did is decent to watch but it's like a long we were f figuring out how to play right so it was like five hours to, to work through the rules kind of once uh, but I'll, I'll be doing that today too so i'm going to do the deck building and then we're going to dive into a solo game and i'll walk through the turns and you'll see it and it all starts to kind of click and make sense as you go cam says i have product but it's unopened that's awesome herman saying omg let the dunking commence uh bob Oh, apparently Cam says Bob, who was an Ashes playtester, Ashes 1.0, uh, used to play a lot of Middle Earth CCG, apparently. Uh, Unwound saying, will you be posting a blog on your solo variation? You know, I think I may have. Let me just see if, if, I, if I did post a blog already. Uh, Cam saying, Ewan is a great looking card. I remember that. I, I wouldn't be upset. Uh, she's in my Aragorn deck as well, but I... I I really love, I just got through listening to the audiobooks for Lord of the Rings, like literally this weekend. 
I finished. And I really, it's funny how these books hit you at different ages, because I first read it, um, it was like right as a, pre, probably 11 or 12 or 13-ish is when I read for the first time one summer. And then, of course, uh, at some point, not long after that, a couple years later, um, the movies came out. And then I think I read them at like 18 or 19, maybe around 20, and then I hadn't read them again. So I, I, I listened to the audiobook actually, and it was fantastic. But the things that stick out to you and the things that appeal to you when you're 13 versus when you're 30 is, is uh, a, a bit different. So one thing I really loved this time through was everything about the Hobbits. Like, just absolutely love that the Hobbits are kind of the main characters in this story. And particularly Merry and Pippin uh, were, you know, Sam and Frodo are always the, a main part of the story. But I really love the idea, especially when they come back to the Shire after it's all over. Uh, you know, you basically have Mary, who's a knight of Rohan now, and Pippin, who's a knight of Gondor. And, like, they're just all decked out, and, like, the their stories are super cool to me. So, uh, you know, like, Mary and uh, Eowyn, given the, their relationship in the books, I might end up building a deck for that at some point, because I just dig that a whole lot. Oh, yeah, the good point. Tom is saying, uh, pull up the one ring. That's, that is some of the best art in the game. <clears throat> Kai is saying, the art based on the books is so good. Herman saying, the Middle Earth CCG is the only card game I still have from my old days. All Magic, Lord of the Rings, TCG, WoW TCG, and Star Wars TCG have been uh, thrown during multiple moves. Adam says, I just finished the Hobbit audiobook and I'm about to start Lord of the Rings audiobook. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, Cam saying, a friend of mine who owned a LCS, local card store maybe, and I learned to play this on Christmas Eve overnight. Good times. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great time. That's, that's such a classic story where you get a new game and that learning experience, especially like during a notable time of the year, like a holiday or something, um, that's super cool. Peter saying, hello, I just received all the challenge decks with the silver borders. That, that's what I got last year. Can't wait to play it after 20 years. That's awesome. So Peter, did you play back in the day? Oh, and can you, for anyone that was around in the 90s, because like in the 90s I was a kid, uh, and I played Pokemon, but mostly I played Pokemon from a small town, and my uncle had a movie rental store, and I would host events out of the back of that. Um, I only occasionally went to game stores when, like, we would, you know, go to the big city of Tulsa. Uh, it would be a, a big to-do. Um, so I'm curious, like, when this game came out, what, what was life like, uh, in, especially in, like, tabletop gaming stores? Because uh, I, I, I didn't even know this existed until the 2000s when I, I, ha I basically happened upon it at a Gen Con. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually flip down. Let's go to a table shot and make sure that's working. Looks like it's working. So... Uh, cool. Comments coming in. Thomas saying, I played it before the challenge decks even existed. Yeah, the challenge decks were kind of late stage, I think, like middle to three quarters way through the game's life. Peter said, oh yes, I'm, I've been playing since 94. I played Doom Trooper, Star Trek CCG, Star Wars CCG, so many of them. Not go, not go too much into each of them, but Alien Predator was so cool. Cam said the mid-90s game comic scene was pretty happening. What do you mean by that? We're like... Uh, I guess m maybe more importantly is how is it different than it is today? I, f I feel like the anticipation and the excitement back then for these kind of games, I remember uh, played the Star Wars TCG a lot in my teenage years, and when a new set was coming out, it's like you didn't know most of the cards in the set, and so like the an excitement to like get that in and, and everyone was there opening like their box or whatever they bought uh, was just like insane. What up, Van? Welcome. <clears throat> Kaya Sand, I'd really love to see the Star Trek CCG on a throwback. It's on the list. I, I actually have product in my office across the way. Jan says, I don't remember the game being available back then in my country. What, what country are you from, Jan? Uh, Pokemon and Magic were pretty much the only card games being played. Uh, really, not, not much has changed. Cam saying, not a whole lot different other than cards were really difficult to find. We didn't have access to much of anything. Peter says, I think that today the games are more or less the same formula over and over again. 
uh, in late 90s and 2000s, the games were so innovative. That, that's definitely how we felt. We've been doing Throwback Thursdays every Thursday uh, since we went into isolation. And uh, the, the way I describe it is like the games in the 90s uh, just had a little more moxie, which is there really weren't rules on what could or couldn't be successful or what the formula looked like, and there weren't precedents and like there, none of that stuff. So even this game, probably my favorite uh, part of the game is something that I, I do not think would happen today. If, it, if <laughs> Obviously, uh, it just is, I've never seen it before or since, really, which is this is a map of Middle Earth, and literally uh, a huge part of the game is I'm going to grab little miniatures in a second, and they represent your companies of people, and they you literally travel across the map, and knowing Middle Earth and knowing where to go and, and how to navigate is, like, super important. And, you know, they, it's pretty abstract. It's not like you have to understand how to survive in the woods necessarily. But at the same time, uh, this sort of thing existing, like, I, I can't imagine a card game today trying to pull this off. Cassandra Burns, hope you're doing well. Uh, I, I haven't seen you in a minute, but I do hope you're doing well. She says, didn't play much in game shops, but I did my Magic and Middle ME is ME Cards Middle Earth at Starbase 21. I used to buy, we, we had a, uh, band trips uh, to, I forget what the area is called, but where it was basically like Bell's Theme Park is right there near uh, Starbase 21. And after, after those competitions and stuff, they would take us to that Casa Bonita right there by uh, Starbase 21. And uh, I, that is actually where a friend and I bought our starters for the first time for the Dragon Ball Z, um, I think it's technically the CCG, the, the one we streamed a, a month or two back. And I remember it was always really exciting to go on those trips because you would pop in. That's how we found Mage Knight on a band trip as well. Uh, that was to Enid in a mall randomly. But Anyways, uh, I, I definitely remember the, a Starbase 21 where I was picking up stuff like that. Cam said, Decipher Games had product but hard to find main characters at first. Uh, once Magic caught on in the mid-90s, there were a new CCG every few weeks. I, I remember that phase distinctly uh, as well. Sean Smith saying, I believe developers and publishers were much more open to experimentation and risk. Various IPs were much more freely available for license as well. I could imagine that. Uh, any more Lord of the Rings TCG Cipher planned from Nicholas? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch back to the... A lot of chat's coming in, so I'll, I'll switch to the main for a minute. Uh, yeah, I definitely think some of those games that we really like uh, will come back. Lord of the Rings TCG being one, Star Wars TCG being another. Um, I actually have a good number of, like, uh, sealed Lord of the Rings TCG boxes that I'm planning to open at some point. I've been working on getting a, a stream set up at home so I can do some of the videos that don't make any sense for us to be doing here on the channel. Uh, unboxing those included. But I assume once we get to that point, uh, it, it'll make sense to come back in with, with fresh decks once I actually know what's going on. Thomas saying the map came out too late, or came out late too. Uh, yeah, I remember the, the first set had like cards. So you had to have a deck of cards that had all these locations on it. The map makes it way cleaner. Uh, Ready Netty says the 90s was something else. I remember someone asking if two main characters in Babylon 5 could marry each other, and we found out they could. Kaya saying, do you think a market still exists for a game like this with maps and miniatures in a CCG package? <sighs> Honestly, like, I, I think the, the market is wide open for people to take these kind of risks. Um, I, I look at something like our, uh, as an example, our PDP model with Ashes. Um, I think that the, there's a lot of space open for games with committed audiences. And so uh, hooks like this are only going to, you know, it probably won't be mass appeal. It could. Uh, that's how that kind of stuff gets born. But I definitely think it's possible for games to take this kind of a risk and do well. Pete saying, uh, I played mostly all, all those CCGs and TCGs. I was always wanting to make something like the anthology of all those old school games, which I did, etc. That's awesome. Van says, to, to me, for the games in the 90s, trading in person, buying packs, et cetera, was where that you chase cards, not so much online. Cam was saying, many game stores were originally comic stores. We played on the floor or the counter or tiny tables. Yeah, I've been there before. Not good. Peter's saying, my favorite OG games are Star Wars, the CCG, and Lord of the Rings, the TCG, both by Decipher. Uh, those are two of my favorites. Star Wars CCG, actually, that's one. Uh, that we will we will definitely revisit because uh, it's just fantastic. There's there's very few games like that. I think it's in the same category as this Middler CCG for me, where it's just 
it's it's willing to tell a story much bigger or play a game that's much bigger than uh, a lot of the games that you're seeing today. Cool. I'm going to switch down to the camp shot. I'm going to grab the miniatures and dice that I need, and then we're going to dive into a middle air CCG deck building session. <clears throat> if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll, I'll see them when I get back, and I'll be happy to answer them. Pete's saying, they're asking, is it more comfortable to use the map or the region cards? I always played only the sites. Uh, I like using the map just because it's awesome. That, that's like one of the most enjoyable parts of this for me is having the map there and get to like look around. And, but I'm also a very directional kind of person like that. So I like being able to kind of see where things are. <clears throat> All right, I have a few tokens here, or a few things. I actually have some uh, GW miniatures from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, they do a like Lord of the Rings movie line, I guess is the right way to say that. Uh, so I'm going to paint some of those up so that I can mark them on the table better. There's like an you know Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas, Arwen, Gandalf, etc. Okay, so uh, I'm interested, if for, especially for people that have played before. I'm interested in dunking the ring. So let me find the one ring and we will go from there because figuring out how to destroy this thing i guess this is kind of like the uh i forget the name what's the name of the council where it's all of them where they form the fellowship is there a proper name to that bryce do you know the answer to this i'm gonna turn your volume on what's it called there it is, Council of Elrond. The Council of Elrond. Where? Let me see if I can find it. All right, is it, are you in here? The One Ring? I, I have all my cards sorted. There, there were, <laughs> I think it was last, last stream where like, I did not and it was, it was not good. So the things I like, and I wanna get some recommendations from people that know better once I get this ring out. I know I saw it this morning. I was making sure I had it. Is it a major item? Can you pull the one ring up, Bryce? I wanna see it. a special item. Hold on. So decks that I'm conceptually interested in, and I'm happy to hear from stream on this, is Duncan the One Ring is high on my list to build. I also uh, would like to build a, and this might be the, the, that same deck, but basically using Gandalf's ability to test rings. 
And then the other one of interest to me is, oh wait, it might be in here. Um, there's obviously like Mary and Ewan. That would be a fun, fun deck to do, like Riders of Rohan style. <clears throat> Uh, there's also, like, the fun, like, ghost deal stuff from Smog. Uh, dwarves, which would be fun. There it is. I don't know what... Oh, I know what this stack is. <laughs> This is a stack, a short stack of the cards that I'm really interested in. Uh, so I, I like the idea of dunking the ring. Um, is is I assume we're just going to go there unless anyone has a, a more ap appealing deck for me uh, to be building. Peter saying, by the way, in times I start to play Miller CCG, it was the time when Lidless Eye came out, the Nazgul expansion, and I can't even win a single game against a wizard deck. Does it change as time goes by? Uh, I don't know. I mean, now it's kind of a wild time because like. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter what the meta is doing. You can do whatever you want. Oh, pal uh, Palantirs are also something that's very interesting to me. I don't know if that's the kind of thing that you have a lot of them in the same deck, but uh, that's something I'm interested in exploring. So if that doesn't happen today, it'll probably happen at some point. Herman's saying, King Under the Mountain is my favorite deck. Who doesn't like killing a dragon and becoming a king? That's totally fair. Peter's saying, do you have any chance to play Nazgul deck? I have not had a chance to play it, um, but it is something that's high on my list. I would love to have an awesome Witch King deck. All right, let's look at the One Ring. We're just going to start uh, start breaking this down. There he is. Look at that guy. I was happy. I was nervous. The, the other version of the Witch King, I don't know if you have that or not, that's the, that's the one I actually was referencing. But the other version uh, is basically there's one that you can play as like a hazard, and there's one that's the hazard version, the black one, like the black background. Uh, the other one is the character version. And so basically I was a little, uh, initially when I was first looking at the game, almost turned off because it was basically the Nazgul themselves. You can't just run like a bunch of Nazgul on your hazard side, or at least it's really just not that good. Uh, because they're so hard to play, because your opponent has to go to very bad places for you to get to play them. So I was a little disappointed, but then I found out you can actually play as your main character is an Osgol, and then I was back in, 100%. Kaya saying, I'm pretty sure it's stealing credit for killing a dragon and becoming king with a wink. That's funny. Chris saying, you can park someone, usually a sage, in a safe spot with the Palantir and have them snipe corruption cards from a distance. What do you mean by snipe corruption cards? All right, let's pull the one ring back up and let's read it real quick and then we'll start figuring out how we're actually gonna build this deck. I found that these, these middle earth CCG decks are kind of intricately woven. And so at first you look at it and you're like, there's no way I could ever build this. But then you just kind of start in, in, and pull any thread. And as you go, one thing leads to another and eventually you just have kind of a, a deck put together. Um, like last time it was like, I know I want to play Aragorn and Arwen and then like, what does that mean? And so like you slowly just start making your way through it and you're going. Uh, in this case though, my win condition becomes destroying the One Ring. Now, I think a macro decision I'm going to have to make is, uh, cause I know that when you do destroy the One Ring specifically, you win. So I don't technically have to care about points if I think that I can actually destroy the ring. But if I want, I can care about points and I can basically have either win condition work out for me, which is I can either score points, or if I do get to destroy the ring, I can make that choice in the middle of the game. I have a feeling there's probably both styles of deck where, you know, you're, you're trying to play the ring and you're trying to destroy it and all that's fine. And if you do, you win. And if not, at least you like scored some points. So uh, we'll see how I feel once we get into it. But I assume those are two very relevant strategies here. Let's see. Peter saying, as far as I remember, they can't move as you wish. They need a rider mode. <laughs> it's been 20 years, though. What up, Scott Kippen? <laughs> I thought that said Scotty Pippen. I'd lose my mind if Scotty Pippen were on the chat. Uh, anyway, it says, yeah, uh, I think he meant dunk deck. 
That's what I'm doing. All right, let's look at the one ring. Plus five direct influence. That means that whoever has the one ring, uh, you know, like if we pull up uh, Frodo, because I assume he'll be interesting for the one ring. Uh, we'll see whatever his cost is. Hold on. All right, so you see that brain right there. He costs five. Um, so, and he has that one with the hand, with the black hand. So he has one direct influence. If he had the one ring, he gets plus five. So he'd have six. And that means, let's pull up Sam, Samwise. I'm just going to wait. There it is. It's easier than me finding the card. Uh, so you see Sam has that four mind stat. So technically, uh, like as an example, Frodo could control Sam and he wouldn't uh, count against your total mind. Uh, you start with 20 mind. And then if we pull up Gandalf, that, that mind is basically, you start with 20 mind worth of characters in play. But then when you play your wizard, they, they are built in with a bunch of direct influence. In this case, Gandalf has 10. Um, so a lot of times when he comes into play, he really, I mean, it's like 50% more characters can be on your board. Um, but the ring, going back to the one ring, has plus five direct influence. So that's, that's a lot. Um, that, that could let a lot of characters control a lot of other characters, freeing up space so you can play more, etc. And it says, unique, the one ring. Playable only with a gold ring and after a test indicates the one ring. We'll get to that in a second. Now, this is, this is actually one of the uh, hallmark elements of this game. That's why I say it's got so much moxie. Look at the amount of text on this card. Sometimes, I, I actually, last night, just so I could refresh myself on the solo m version of the game, I, I had my, myself playing the stream on the background. And like I, I had to chuckle at one point because I was just reading a card. And on stream, I'm like, I had to read it again because like I, I just forgot what the card was doing by the time I got to the very end. Anyways, uh, it says, so we're just going to walk it through. You just got to, that, this game demands that you just take your time. That, that's part of why I love it. It's like, you can't just like mid-max, aggro, blitz through it, play quick games. That is not this experience. And if that's what you're looking for, this is probably not the Lord of the Rings game for you. Um, all right, so it says, playable only with a gold ring and after a test indicates the one ring. So before we even go to the next part, I want to show you what that looks like. Let me find it. Do 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 do. Oh, okay. Uh, beautiful gold ring. Let's pull that up. So if we pull a beautiful gold ring up, and it's worth noting on these cards, the top left value in the square. Uh, and that, that icon, the square, is really important. That, that means it's a certain kind of card. A uh, beautiful gold ring is a gold ring. It's an item. So the, the square in the top left corner means that it's an item. And the black number there is the point value. It's how many points you score uh, for having this item in play at the end of the game. So the beautiful gold ring says, discard a beautiful gold ring when tested. If tested, make a roll or draw a number. We won't worry about the drawing. To determine which ring may be immediately played. So you see it says the one ring, 12+. plus. So in this game, it's, it's a 2d6 system. So if I rolled 2d6s, I got a 4. So I'd look at the little chart, and at, at a 4, it's a magic ring, or a lesser ring can be played at any result. So as an example of what that looks like, this could be a good uh, Gandalf ring, ring style deck. But uh, let's see. I'm going to find a magic ring. I know I've got them here. I assume what what's a what's the name of a magic ring in this game? <laughs> Vincent, I love that. You'll comprehend the card precisely when you mean to. I I have dwarven rings. I know one of these is gonna be a magic ring. Is Narya a magic ring? Does it say it doesn't say magic ring anywhere? And there's like Vilia. Uh, ring of Stealth is a magic ring, apparently. So I rolled a four, so I can either play a magic ring or a lesser ring of any result. Uh, and so I would discard the beautiful gold ring and put it out. Now, to play the one ring with the beautiful gold ring, I'd have to roll a 12. 
And there's things that, that modify a ring stat or a ring roll, uh, which is going to be important, and we'll come back to that in a minute. As an example, if we pull up Gandalf, the man himself, he, uh, all corruption checks are modified by plus one, uh, can tap to test a gold ring. So if he has a gold ring, he can, he can t exhaust, basically, to test the beautiful gold ring. And if you get a 12 or more, you can play the one ring. 12 on 2d6 is tough. Uh, there are better rings for this, which we'll get to when we start cruising through all these cards. But for now, let's bring back the one ring, and we'll see what else it says. Plus five prowess to a maximum of double the bearer's starting prowess. If you look at the bottom left, there's a plus five, plus five. That's the plus five prowess. Um, the plus five direct influence is up top. He also gets plus five body to a maximum of ten. So that's the that's the bottom corner. The the prowess and the body. Uh, prowess is what you use when you're defending an attack. Body is what you use if you fail defending an attack to like decide if you get hit or you know dead. So that plus five plus five is really strong with obviously a maximum. It's a maximum is built in. Then it says bearer may may make a corruption check modified by minus two to cancel a strike. This does not work against undead and Nazgul strikes. So you can cancel a strike if you make a corruption check. Now it's important to note the bottom right value on this one ring is a six. Uh, that is your corruption stat. So when you're making a corruption check, the one ring is going to make that very hard because it's the one ring. It's trying to be found. We all know the rules of the game here. So I'm going to pull up my uh, short list. I, I did never get to that blog, uh, my solo rules. I think I posted that. If I didn't, I will post it somewhere. Um, I know I posted a, like, here's the short version of the condensed rules that I made. So when you're making a corruption check, you start at zero corruption points. If you had the one ring, you'd be at six. And then any untapped characters that the location can tap had one before you roll, and then you roll 2d6. So let's say I rolled, you know, uh, six. If the result plus one for every character that I tapped, is greater than my corruption point. So this is six to six. It's not greater. Uh, then you're fine. If the result plus one is equal to, or if it's one less than, you discard the character. So if I had this on a character uh, and I rolled this, I would literally discard the character. Uh, if it's greater than one less, the character is actually not just discarded, but removed from the game. So if I rolled, as an example, uh, four compared to the six, the character would be gone permanently. They've, they've become, you know, they've entered the twilight. They've become a Nazgul or whatever. Uh, so the corruption on this is super high. Uh, ideally, we find people that are really not susceptible to corruption checks. But again, thematically, it's really cool because it's symbolizing putting on the ring, right? You can't get away from undead and Nazgul because they can see you anyway. But all the other kind of strikes that could happen to you, you can literally put the ring on, uh, to avoid the strike, but then you have to deal with the fact that your, you know, the ring is slowly corrupting your mind and soul. So, now that's one ring. So that is literally what everything uh, we're about to do centers on, and whether or not that's the sole strategy of the deck is, uh, you know, we'll see. But you can see, like, the one ring has that six in the top left corner, so it's worth a ton of points. Most games you're going to land between 20 and 30 points from what I've seen by the time the game's over. And the game ends in a couple ways. One, if we destroy the ring, which we'll talk about in a minute. Two, uh, it depends on how many decks you're playing. This is uh, one of the cool rules of the game. I think the standard game was two decks, which is when a player goes through their deck, basically, uh, they can trigger to, to basically call the council and see who has more influence to win the game. In the game, you represent a, you know one of the wizards trying to basically gain influence uh, to do whatever you want to do in Middle Earth. Uh, if you're playing a two-deck game, when both players have gone through the deck twice, the game has to be called. That's just, just the end. Uh, so that's the standard way the game's going to end. And of course, if you dunk the ring, it's game over. Kaya's saying, couldn't you wait till the last second to figure out if it is the one ring and then try, so you can try to avoid getting corrupted as much? Possible, but I'm not sure. So let me pull up the card that is actually going to let us dunk the ring and win the game. Uh, I think it's like Cracks of Doom, something like that. That looks like it. I can see it on the screen, I just have to find the actual physical, physical card. Ah, there's the magic rings, like a big stack of them.
42 Smeagol saying apparently you can test the ring at Mount Doom. I know you're here. What kind of card is that? Is that a short event? Let me see what's in this thing. There it is. I think uh, three is the number of copies of a card you can play in this game, technically. Not that I'm going to, but I'm going to get three out just in case. So Cracks of Doom says, only playable if the one ring is at Mount Doom. The bearer makes a corruption check modified by minus four. So the minuses all apply to your roll. That's important to remember. So, you know, if I roll a seven, it's minus four. Putting me at three, if I had the one ring, that would easily just nuke who my character is. If successful, the one ring is destroyed and its bearer, bearer's player wins. So if you can win a corruption check with the one ring at Mount Doom, essentially at a, you need greater than ten. So that's a very slim uh, number. Also, look at the art on Cracks of Doom. Isn't that, isn't that Bugatti? Yeah, that is just so good. Uh, yeah, it's so good. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I just love it. I can't get over it. Uh, so a few things worth knowing, right? Uh, Mountain Doom, if you're unfamiliar with Middle Earth, Shire's up here. Uh, Lorien is here in the middle. Uh, Minas Tirith is here, some places, that's, you know, Aragorn's uh, where he became king. Uh, Mount Doom is here, and these mountains here are the problem that Sam and Frodo faced, which is they were ultimately, let me try to find it. So, you know, they were coming from Lorien, and they basically got uh, to the, uh, uh, the statues holding the, I forget what that's called, they're holding their hand out. Um, which is, the, that's the Anduin River that's doing that. And so that's where they split, and uh, the uruk captured Merry and Pippin trying to take them over here to Isengard, right? Going this direction. So Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli were chasing them down through Rohan, which is right here. Uh, whereas Sam and Frodo went this way, and they got, you know, lost, and the Dead Marshes are literally right here, which they eventually go through with uh, Gollum slash Smeagol. Uh, and then the Black Gate is, this is Minas Morgul. Where's the Black Gate? I want to say this is the Black Gate right here. What is the name of the, uh, the like, big city that the Nazgul are in that Sam and Frodo almost get caught? Kaya saying it's not just you, the art's amazing. Minas Morgul, okay. That's where they almost get caught? Where's the Black Gate at? Anyways, uh, all that said, right, uh, you can't go through these mountains. Uh, you have to get to Mount Doom in order to uh, to destroy the ring. I think that is the way they went. So they kind of went through the... Uh, that's right. That's totally right. Because they get captured by uh, Faramir, and he takes them to Henneth Annan, which is their, like... Uh, can you pull up Henneth Annan? I think that's their waterfall hideout. With the, like, pond that if you swim in, they'll ax you. Yeah, see, that's their waterfall hideout. So they, they go down through here, um, and then they get denied at the, the, because they've already been denied at the Black Gate. And then they go through Minas Morgul, and then Sh Shalab's Lair, Sirenth Ungol, and then they cross over and they journey through uh, Gorgoroth into the Mount Doom, which is crazy. So I have to, g <laughs> basically to dunk the ring, I think that's exactly the path you almost have to take. You could technically come up from Athelion down here, but either way, you're going to have to go through Minas Morgul, Shalob's Lair, and Sirith Ungol to get to Mount Doom. Yeah. 
What up, Tim? Uh, Techno saying, could you loop around through the horse planes? Yeah. Horse planes. Then it's Nern, Gorgoroth, Mount Doom. Is that is that how most people did it back in the day? Because like, technically, Frodo and Sam wouldn't have done that because literally the distance from the Dead Marshes here and back around would have been more of a journey than it took them to get from like the Shire to the Dead Marshes. Tim uh, saying, this game looks great. I have no idea what's happening though. Nothing's really happening yet. I'm just looking at a map and trying to figure out my game plan. I'm trying to dunk the one ring, which will pop up. To do that, I have to find the, the one ring and then I have to get to Mount Doom and play Cracks of Doom and pass a crazy corruption check. 42 Smeagol says, Lorien, Easterling Camp, play Master of Esgaroth, Mount Doom. Master of Esgaroth. What kind of card is Master of Esgaroth? Let's see if that pops up. Okay, it's an event. Let's go. F oh, it's right here on the top. That's a wild. It says, play about the end of the organization phase on a moving company. If the company moves to border hold, it can take a second movement hazard phase immediately following its first movement hazard, ha movement hazard phase. So, you're saying it's Lorien, which is here. I'm going to put this red token there. To Easterling Camp, which is here. And then play Master of Esgaroth. That lets you take another move, because this is literally, this was here. It's one, two, three regions, and then one, two, three, because you move region, region, then the specific location. So you could get there like that. That seems cheesy. Peter's saying, I'm 100% sure Peter Jackson played this game. I know many art was directly from how, but there are other arts from other artists which are like the copy and paste from movies. I'm sure the art was looked at a lot when they were making the movies because you're bringing all this stuff to life for the first time like that. Fortitude Smeagol says, it is super cheesy. I almost feel like they should have just had these mountains extend to the end of the map so that you just can't go around that way. Like th these mountains go here. Apparently, Easterling Camp here. Can you pull up Easterling Camp, the location? Apparently, it's got really good draw for the for the player. Oh, four? What? What's the? Is it four? Four? Lord of mercy! That's crazy. Herman saying Easterling Camp is OP. I mean, I, I, I would be inclined to not take that road. Now, tell me this. If I'm moving from, uh, you know, let's say, Athelion uh, to Mount Doom, do I have, to, I have to literally go through each of these locations, right? Do I have to stop at each, like Minas Morgul, Shalob's Lair, Sionith Ungol, because there's not a region there? Yeah, I, I know the icons on that path is dangerous, but that's the dunk in the ring that we all uh, have come to know and love. Whereas around the outside, over to the Easterling camp, seems, uh, well, not, not so intimidating. Also, for people that played back in the day, I'm curious, because like, what I've noticed is you can play a game without going to that many super scary places, which is what makes the Nazgul hazards kind of hard to play. Um, because they're keyed to like the really scary places. Uh, but you know, it's the kind of thing where like, if players aren't putting in hazards that can be played in scary places because players are avoiding going to scary places, uh, it means that some of the scarier places become less scary uh, from a meta perspective. I feel like that would be fascinating. Because like, if no one's putting in the Witch King because no one's going to uh, those, uh, what are they called? Darkholds or Ruins and Lairs? 
then eventually at some point in the tournament, I feel like strategies that score a lot of points by going, can you pull up the black, black version? Uh, score a lot of points from going to these kind of scary places uh, would eventually be kind of off meta enough that uh, it wouldn't be n nearly as bad. Peter said, I'm not sure if you've already had the party of picking the characters, but if not, please take Hobbits. I mean, I think Frodo or Bilbo has to be one of them. 42 Smeagol says, Triple Shadowlands is mostly redundant, though. Only one, only really one creature that requires double Shadowlands. Herman says, you can always use sight movement from Lorien, Zach. It's one turn straight to Mount Doom. It's just a very scary route. But the where Minas Morgul and Sirith Ungol are, there's not a region there. Oh, there is. It's Imlad Morgul. So technically, I can move through that location as a region. Is what you're saying? One, one, two. All right. Let's start looking at characters. Uh, and there's other rings that'll be better for this. 42 Smeagol says there's an optional rule, though, that you have to stop in Imlad Morgul or move through Nern. That makes sense. So basically, you have to stop somewhere in Imlad Morgul, which is the Nazgul city, Shalob's lair, or the, like, tower that Frodo got captured in. Look at that. Look at that map card. Those are in the first set. They have those region cards. That is just classy. Like, pull up Lorien. That's probably a good one to just reference all the time. So one of the first decisions that I think is worth uh, considering is which wizard to play. Gandalf is inherently good with rings because he can, he can test rings naturally, but I'm just going to look at the other wizards just to get a feel for them. I, I, I find it hard to get super excited about any of the other wizards that aren't Saruman. Even listening to the books... You, you hear Radagast mentioned um, and the other wizards, but like we just don't get any time with them. So are there books out there that, that focus more on that? The first wizard uh, that's not Gandalf, by the way, is Alatar. We're just going to read him. He's got 10 direct influence. He's got 6 prowess, 9 body. And he's unique during the movement and hazard phase. The number of cards an opponent draws based on his company's movement is reduced by one. If in a haven when a hazard creature is played on another company, he may join that company and face one of the hazard creature strikes, he must tap and make a corruption check immediately. So he's kind of cool because he bounces around. He can literally be from a, a haven and he can go to any party that's suffering an attack. Techno says, are you limited to just one wizard? Because if not, I feel like things could get silly. You can only have one in play. All right, next we get Palando. And so Palando, same uh, stat line, plus uh, 10 direct influence, 6-9. His ability, though, and their, their subtypes are, are different as well, uh, a little bit. But anyways, his, his stack says, his controlling player may keep one more card than normal in his hand. Opponents must discard his... Opponent must discard his cards face up. Do you normally discard face down? I didn't know that. We also get Radagast, of course. Uh, he actually looks super cool here. Uh, 10 direct influence, same stats. Unique, if his company moves to a new site during the movement hazard phase, he can draw an additional card for each wilderness in his company's site path, plus one to all of his corruption checks. So he wants to really, I mean, that's thematic from what we know of him. Then, of course, we get Saruman, who's looking like a boss here. Unique may tap to use a Palantir. At the beginning of each of his end-of-turn phases, he may tap to take one spell card from his discard pile and return it to hand. So he obviously can play spells and keep, keep getting them. And he's good with Palantirs, which is thematic. Cool. Uh, so I don't know which wizard I'm going to go with yet, but, you know, the Gandalf is my favorite. Spoiler. Uh, looking through characters, I'm just going to pull up ones. If you have recommendations of characters that I should consider, 
uh, now is the time. But I'm, I'm going to go straight to Frodo just for theme and see if I, I like that or not. I assume he's going to be... Just based on what I know of this game, I bet he's really good for the ring. Also, I love that art of him. He looks very hobbitish in the art. Also, I want to mention, uh, I, fi I finished listening to the, the Lord of the Rings books this past weekend. And the weekend before that was actually my wife's birthday. And what she wanted to do was watch rewatch all the Lord of the Rings extended edition movies. And so we watched the first two uh, over the weekend. And uh, Faramir in the books is way better than Faramir in the, in the, the movies. And the extended version particularly makes him very kind of cruel to Gollum. Um, I... I uh, you know, didn't really think about that bef before. And I st in the movies, he's fine, um, and I like the actor a lot. But in the books, he's he's one of my favorite characters uh, that I, I wish we had a lot more time with. But, anyways, uh, he's cool in this game, and he's really awesome in the books. Kaya says, "If you take Sam, I beg you, take Bill the Pony. They should never be apart." That's funny. All right, here's Frodo. Uh, he's one, one. Prowess, but he's got a nine body. That's so hilarious theme-wise. Oh my god, I love that. Um, anyways, he, he's five mind and his one direct influence. Unless he is one of the starting characters, he can only be brought into play at his home site, which is, of course, Bag End. All of his corruption checks are modified by plus four. Minus two marshalling points if eliminated. So if he gets eliminated, you are my, literally down two points, um, which is the two points he starts with. But, uh, and is it an extra two points that you're down? Because that's crazy. But he's plus four on corruption checks. So he's super good with a one ring, right? He basically cancels out the minus four from Cracks of Doom, which means your corruption check it went from you need a better than a 10 to a better than a six. Those odds got way better. Okay, so it's two extra points if he gets eliminated. So two, he's worth two points. And he also, if he goes away, not only do you not have those points, but you also get minus two on top of that. So Frodo seems... Uh, Seems like a, a winner here. Chris saying they do that for super famous characters. Well, that's cool. So it's basically a risk for playing the character that every, everyone wants to be playing. Uh, so now I'm just going to cruise on down. I, I feel obligated to look at Samwise. Samwise Gamgee. Sam Gamgee. Let's see. He's there with Bill. Uh, unique. He's also a 1-9. Four, four mind, zero direct influence. Unless he is the one, one of your starting characters, he can only be brought into play at his home site, which is Bag End. All of his corruption tracks are modified by plus three. So uh, you get a sense that if something happened to Dear Frodo, you could potentially still complete the game if you had someone like Sam Gamgee. All right, now, uh, is it kind of just an open book at that point? You have 20 starting points, right? So this is uh, nine, even if I played both of these. Uh, I, uh, I, I actually assume, like I said, it's a very ornately woven fabric when you're playing this game and you're building the deck for it. But I, I'm going to look at the other Hobbits really quick just for reference. But it's the kind of thing where like, it might be that some of the cards I end up wanting to play require certain traits, like Sage or Scout or whatever, uh, to get them to survive. Because I'm looking... Frodo is a scout, a diplomat, and a hobbit. Sam is a scout, a ranger, and a hobbit. So diplomat and ranger cards are going to be playable by them, and scout both of them. So that's going to be a lot of the like concealment and cancely stuff, which is going to be important. But you know, like the rings, what do I need the rings to get into play and to test well and to get the one ring and stuff? Uh, so I'm not going to choose my other characters yet, but I am going to look at the hobbits and then I'm going to look through all the cards that aren't hobbits. Uh, Pippin. One point, he's got the same 1-9 stat line. Uh, unless he's one of the starting, he has to start his home site. All of his corruption checks are modified by a plus two. Okay, so I assume Mary is going to be in a similar, similar looking character. Mary, 1-9, 4-1 on the stats. Unless he's one of the start, can only be brought in at back end. Corruption checks are modified by a plus two. Okay, so Mary and Pippin are actually like uh, surprisingly... That is one thing I do for the complexity of this game. I feel like they went simple in a lot of directions that are 
uh, fascinating to me. Like the fact that Mary and Pippin are so simple is uh, not expected. Someone asked about Fatty Bulger. Let's see if we have him. Let's see if he does anything relevant for me. I don't have the card, so I won't be playing with old Fatty. Also, the Gladriel art, every time it gets me. People say she's expensive to play in this game. Uh, Kaya asking, is Tom Bombadil? Uh, hold on. I gotta, there's Galadriel. Look at that art. I love that art. Uh, asking if Tom Bombadil is any good, and uh, he is. In a lot of the online things, he's like one of the first cards people recommend putting in. All right, so let's look at this. What else do I need to make this dream? I'm going to look at the minor items to see what the various rings that we have. We already uh, saw the beautiful gold ring. We also have the fair gold ring. The fair gold ring, when tested, uh, it's the one ring on an 11 or a 12, so that's already better. Uh, dwarven ring, magic ring, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, so that's pretty, so ultimately, like, even that, you, you learn on these rings. They're basically the same thing, uh, except for they just give you a, a certain result at a different test value. So that's nice to know. Anyone offhand know how many different rings there are that can turn into the one ring? A lot of magic rings in here. Precious gold ring. Getting better. Uh, a 10, 11, or a 12, it turns into the one ring. And that looks like it's it. Yeah, people are saying precious gold ring is the best. So uh, I'm going to put the fair gold ring and the beautiful gold ring back. OK. So uh, let's look at gold ring item. So you can play, you can play a gold ring item is that any any location where an item is playable, or is it are there specific locations for rings? Hmm. Looks like there's gold ring locations. That's fun. Like Isle of the Dead that Live has the uh, looks like a camera, a square with a circle inside of it. You probably have to go to there to get a gold ring. Uh, let's see, where's it at? Herman saying you want a Sildor scroll. It makes it plus eight. I believe I had that in my short stack here. Let's see. Let's find it. <clears throat> I also really want to make an Aragorn Paz of the Dead deck. The Scroll of Isildur? Yep, you got it. Unique, when a gold ring is tested in a company with the Scroll of Isildur, the result of the roll is modified by plus two. It's pretty good. And it's unique, so when you, when you have something that's unique, you can only play one. Worth, worth knowing. Uh, 
Oh, there's another card here called Golem's Fate. Only playable if the One Ring and Golem are both at Mount Doom during the Sight phase. The One Ring is destroyed and its bearer's player wins. Huh. I'm at least going to put that over here and look at it. Now, let me pull up Golem. That art's pretty good. He's a what? A triangle? Gullum. Unique playable at Goblin Gate or Moria. Where is Goblin Gate? I know where Moria is. Here. Anyone know where the Goblin Gate is? Pardon me, sir. Goblin Gate. I'm looking. Oh, there it is. Way up here. Okay. If his company's size is less than three, tap Golem to cancel an attack against his company key to Wilderness or Shadowlands. Tap Golem if he is at the same non-haven site as the One Ring. Then both Golem and the One Ring are discarded. Okay, let's think about that. Again, uh, you got to really process here. Uh, so, he can be played at those two locations. If his company size is less than three, so that'd be two or one, but it'd be two, tap him to cancel an attack in a wilderness or shadow land. So he can cancel an attack at Shaleb's Lair, ironically. I'm sure that's fun. Uh, it's the same icon on... Um, actually, it's not Shaleb's Lair. It's and Imlad Morgul, which is that region. Uh, tap him if he's at the same non-haven side as the One Ring. So if he's at a location with the One Ring, they are discarded. How do you, how do you possibly pull off Golem's fate? Chris saying Golem is tech for and against a One Ring. Uh, if your opponent is going to dunk, you play Golem out first and go steal the ring. That's really funny, actually. I, I'm i not sure. Oh, wait. Is the tap Golem if he's at the same non-haven side as one ring? An option? It doesn't just happen? There it is. Man, can you imagine 95, 96 figuring this out on your own? This is insanity. Luckily, you're here and you're helping me with this. So, I like this a lot. We uh, and it's an ally. So that that's my you see, Golem here has the two points up top in the, the triangle. So at the end of a game, uh, there's different categories you want to score in, and categories that your opponent scores in that you don't. And there's a couple that are excluded from this. Uh, they actually get double the points. So like, if you don't play an ally, and there's really not that many allies in the game. Um, Anyways, I feel like Golem's got to go in. Yeah, Chris saying the language templating is lousy. I mean, it, it makes you realize uh, what has happened in tabletop in the past 20 years. I'll say that much. Smeagol saying, that's an ironic name now, you can't use your opponent's Golem uh, to win with Golem's fate. So it has to be your Golem. Okay. Well, I like having options. I feel like Golem's Fate and Cracks of Doom are... are do, do most decks have both in? This is kind of what I was saying, though. Is like once you start constructing what it is you need to do, uh, it, it starts becoming pretty obvious. Uh, Smeagol saying, yep, that's exactly what happened. Chris says, plan for Golem's fate, but bring Cracks of Doom just in case. We're going to do it. Uh, people are also saying Leaf Brooch. I assume that's a, a minor item. Let me see if I can find it.
Oh no. I don't have it. It might be in the stack here. Hold on. That's the other joy of a collectible game, especially back then, is like, you, you, I, I would go a long time in a lot of games not even knowing that a card like Leaf Brooch existed because I didn't have it or pull it in a pack. Let's see if I have it in my stack. Doesn't look like I'm leaf broaching. Let me, uh, this is the final stack that it might be in. Are there any other like super critical cards I should be considering right now? For those that know. Also, is this a Gates of Morning style deck? What up, Trevor? A friend or three? I believe that's an event. Let's look at it. Yep, a friend of three. For every character in the influencing character's company, a friend of three gives a plus one modification to an influence check or to a corruption check made by a character in the same company. That's a really good card. Agreed. Man, that could be brutal if you friend, played a friend of three to met, like influence your opponent's character off the board. Kanui saying, smoke rings and long bottom leaf if you got them. Uh, are those events? Let's pull up some uh, smoke rings. I think I do have both of those. Yep, let me find it in my giant pile of events here. Doesn't look like I have smoke rings, but let's look for a long bottom leaf. Uh, Chris saying halfling strength and halfling stealth. I have them here, so let's get those out. We'll uh, do what we do with most deck building, which is get a bunch of cards out and then slowly whittle down. Doesn't look like I have long bottom leaf. What up, Tim? Tim, why is deck building so satisfying? It's, uh, this, this game particularly is just crazy to me for that very reason. Like, you're basically constructing a, a story. I'm going to do this. Um, let's read these Halfling cards. So, Halfling Strength, Hobbit only, the Hobbit may untap, or he may move from wounded to well and untap during his organization phase, or plus four modification to one corruption check. It seems important. 
Halfling Strength. Hobbit only cancels a strike against a Hobbit. That seems really good. Also notice on the top of this stack over here, the Mithril Coat, uh, which is unique. Armor plus three to body to a maximum of ten. Don't know if I'll end up playing it, but it does seem thematic. Smeagol says, apparently Longbottom Leaf is the most expensive non-promo card. Because it's from the Balrog set, which is... Uh, it's like these two decks where you can play as the Balrog, but I've seen them going for like seven or eight hundred dollars for the pair. Mmm, Sting is thematic. I, I gotta have Sting in here for every reason. Favorite wrestler, cool weapon. Now, I feel like for the times I'm testing the ring and it goes poorly, having other rings is not a bad idea. Is Sting a major item or a minor item? There's Sting, unique weapon. Plus one to prowess to a maximum of eight, plus two to a hobbit's prowess to a maximum of eight. And it's a minor item, which is good. Henry Rodriguez saying free to choose can be helpful. All right. So let's, I'm going to just do a cursory look through some of these smaller stacks real quick. It's like a build a pony. Unique playable at Bree or Bag End. Playable even if the site is tapped. If at a non Haven site and if his company size is three or less, you can discard build a pony at the end of his company's turn and replace it. It's sight with the nearest haven. Hmm. That's interesting. Don't know that I would play it. I also wonder if there's an int deck that would be fun. Like Mary and Pippin and getting all the int allies and doing something crazy. Chris saying apparently back in the day had a deck that abused Dwarven Ring, uh, which untaps sites, uh, whichever ring that is, uh, to play a bunch of Ents and just camp out at Welling Hall. How do we feel about When I Know Anything? You play it on a Sage uh, during the site phase at a site where information is playable, which can modify a corruption check, but I doubt you can't play information in Mount Doom. I guess you can play information about Doom. Kaya saying, are the Ents only allies? No actual characters. Yeah, as far as I know, the, uh, the Ents are only allies. There's like Quick Beam, Tree Beard. Those will pop up shortly, I'm sure. There's Quick Beam. The art on, in, on them is actually pretty hilarious because like they weren't restricted by anything, but like looking at Tree Beard, it looks like a person in a tree suit, even though they could have drawn it more like a tree. Do you agree? Doesn't look like a, like a, it reminds me of like kaiju movies where it's like 
they're restricted because they needed to be able to move around and stuff. All right, let's look at some of these other rings that could possibly come into play. Magic Ring of Lore. Magic Ring, playable only with a gold ring, and after a test, indicates a magic ring. Give the bear Sage skill. If the bear is already a Sage, he can tap to use a Palantir. May not be duplicated on a given character. That's fine. Magic Ring of Courage. Gives the bear Warrior skill. If the bear is already a Warrior, plus two Prowess. Okay, so these are pretty simple. Magic Ring of Stealth. Gives the bear the Scout skill. If they're already a scout, they can cancel a strike directed against them. Our Frodo, yep, Frodo and Sam are both scouts, so I like that ring a lot, actually. Because that's free cancels. I feel like if they're going to go into these, like, terrifying lands, having cancels around is really good. Uh, Magic Ring of Nature gives the bear the ranger skill. If it's already a ranger, can tap to cancel an attack. It's pretty good. Are either of them rangers? Technically, Sam's a ranger, so I'm just going to put one in the stack. Magic Ring of Words. I love all these rings. Uh, gives the bear the diplomat skill of already a diplomat, plus three to direct influence. Hold on a second. Um, so Sam's influence is, or mind, Sam Gamgee's is a mind of four. Frodo has direct influence of one. Technically, if he had a Magic Ring of Words, uh, he could directly control Sam, and Sam wouldn't take up any points. So that's interesting. Uh, lesser Ring, plus two direct influence. That's not enough for, uh, for that to really work for me. Now, let's look at that gold ring. There's also Dwarven Rings. All right, well, let's look at them. There's the Dwarven Ring of Thrar's Tribe. It's unique. It's a Dwarven Ring, playable only with a gold ring, and after a test indicates a gold ring. Values in parentheses and brackets apply to a Dwarf Bear. So that doesn't really matter. All this references dwarves, Dwarf Bear, so we'll go ahead and pass. Classic Concealment. Tap a Scout to cancel an attack against his company. That's probably got to go in. Uh, how do we feel about gates of gates of mourning in the stack? Let me let me pull up my gates of mourning. Let me find it. Gates of Morning. When Gates of Morning is in play, all environment hazard cards in play are immediately discarded, and all hazard environment effects are canceled, cannot be duplicated. So the thing about Gates of Morning is uh, that when it's in play, there's a lot of cards that reference it. And there's a lot of bad cards that get worse when this is out. That's one of the main things. As an example, like Fair Travels and Free Domains, playable at the end of the organization phase if target company plays a new site card. The hazard limit for the target company decreases by one for every free domain. Uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, fair Travels and Dark Domains. Uh, you'll notice it says, if the site path has at least one dark domain, the hazard limit for the target company decreases by one, or by two if Gates of Morning is in play, to a minimum of two. So you could send four people in. Normally the hazard limit's four, but then it would be two if Gates of Morning was out and you played that card. A lot of different opinions. Andrew's saying Gates of Morning could be very useful. Just having one or two can help a lot. Whereas Smeagol's saying Gates of Morning eats up a lot of deck space. Andrew's saying you don't want the person carrying the one ring to have any other corruption points on them. That's a fair point. Smeagol recommending instead of Gates of Morning, Twilight. I'll try to find. Let's 
see what Twilight says. Nothing. All right. Uh, let me see if I have Twilight. I have the Evan Star, which is good art. I do not have Twilight. Uh, try Gates of Twilight, Bryce. That might be it. You have you have a card called Twilight. Yeah, that's it. But that's a bad guy card. Yeah, it has, it's a hazard card that doubles as a resource. Yeah, that's, this is all correct. Some shenanigans. I, it's one of the, my favorite parts of this new office is there's windows, so I can see outside of this room. And uh, I don't know what Ops is doing, but there's some f very physical labor happening right now. <laughs> I can see him just struggling. Okay, uh, so I know there's, okay, look. I literally, these are short and long events. I just want to show you these stacks. This is a ton of cards. I'm not going to put Bryce through that. Uh, <laughs> he laughs in the background. Oh, we did Ashes yesterday. Ashes deck building. I, the only way I know how to build decks for that game is to go through every card and see if it applies to the Phoenix board that I'm playing. And so he just had to work his tail off making these cards pop up. Uh, tell me people that know uh, what's going on, short events and long events that I should be looking at for this deck particularly. I know there's a ton of them, uh, but if you have ones that I should definitely be looking at, I'm going to scan through uh, and see if I notice any that are particularly just uh, sticking out to me. Um, I love the art and on and forth he hasten hastened. Don't know if it's useful for me or not. Uh, Smeagol saying, uh, Wizard's Test... I'll get to the W's at some point. Saying concealment, I agree on concealment. Concealment's got to be in. It's already here in my short stack. Anders saying, I think you've got most of the key cards. Well, at this point, it's even just like, what, what are the recommended cards? I think concealment's really good. I hear a lot about dark quarrels. So that's a good example of Gates of Morning. It, it can cancel an attack by orcs, trolls, or men, or if Gates of Morning is in play, it can have the number of strikes basically on an attack. A friend of three is already definitely, it's on the table for sure. I'm going to put Dark Quarrels in. I'm just going to grab cards that people are saying. Uh, Marvel's Told. I've heard about that a lot as well. So we'll get there in a second. Uh, Dodge is another one. That I hear about a lot. Smeagol saying with uh, Hobbits, you don't want to face any strikes. Yeah, that makes Dark Quarrels not as good. It's really simple, but the art on Escape is also appealing to me. What about the Fair Travels cards? Like Fair Travels in Borderlands? I'm sure knowing what I'm going to be doing 
what kind of icon is this? It is the Shadowland and so the Shadowland and Wilderness and what kind of region is this? Lots of awesome comments coming in. Uh, Smeagol saying, uh, it's just that the second ability on Dark Worlds isn't really that good in the deck, yeah, for sure. Chris saying you need those kind of cancelers for auto attacks if you have a small company. Otherwise, just bring beefcakes to defeat the auto attacks and get the scroll out at Moria or whatever. Uh, Henry saying, what I like about free to choose compared to a friend of three, so pull up free to choose if you can, Bryce, is that one doesn't have to hold on to it until the corruption check. Uh, let me see if I have free to choose you in. Any recommendations on the fair travels? Uh, Smeagol says they're beginner's traps. Can't, can't argue. I don't have free to choose, so that's not an option. I already have Halfling Stealth out. That seems good. Halfling Strength. I already got that. And, you know, the other thing I'm going to have to figure out is who my other characters are. Um, and the real thing is, like, is it just Sam and Frodo doing the journey, like, in the movies? Or am I pairing it with someone? Uh, and if I'm not pairing it with someone, I feel like I need the characters on the other half of the board to really be a problem for my opponent. <laughs> I love everything about Tom Bombadil's cards. This one's called Hey! Exclamation point, Come Marry Doll. I actually really dig the art on Lordly Presence. It's like classic wizard art, and it's Gandalf the White. Uh, Lore of the Ages is really cool, too. Just a good-looking card. Uh, many turns and doublings. Sam can play it. Cancels an attack by wolves, spiders, animals, or undead. Gates of Morning is in play. You decrease the hazard limit against the ranger's company by one. No minimum. That's interesting. I have a lot of cancels already, I think. All right, Marvel's Told. I hear about this card all the time. Tap a sage to force the discard of a hazard non-environment permanent event or long event. Sage makes a corruption check modified by minus two. Seems... Very specific. So a non-environment permanent event or a long event you can discard. I like the coloring on that card either way. Like, look, Tom just dominating. Master of wood, water, or hill. You guys were talking about this earlier. Ritual, tap a sage to change one wilderness to a borderland or a shadow land or, sh or one shadow land to a wilderness or a borderland to a wilderness. Sage makes a corruption check. 
So, you know, this can change. Let's look at what this changes. Uh, Mlad Morgul is, it looks like, a Shadowland. So it can change a Shadowland to a Wilderness, which is less bad. I'll put it in the, in the short stack. I also love the art on it, so. Mm, look at Mirror of Galadriel. Not, not good in solo, but it is a great looking card. Misty Mountains. Not today. Hanging in there, Bryce. Great. Mountains of Shadow. All right, this looks hobbity. Muster. Warrior only. Is Sam a warrior? He should be. Sam the Slayer is not a warrior. Wow, you just automatically get a... Uh, Faction. New friendship is interesting. Diplomat only, so Frodo could play it. Uh, plus three to an influence check or plus two to a corrupt check made by a character in the same company. Does he count himself? I'm going to put it to the side just in case. Uh, there's also Old Friendship. Wow. See you, Chris. Love this comment. It says, happy, got to take off happy dunking because it's a Chris. So awesome you're putting out free content for so many games, including this one that is near and dear to my heart. It makes me feel like I'm 10 years old again. It makes me feel like I'm a kid again, which is probably why I'm, I'm so keen to keep doing it. Kaya saying, I got to head to head out to dinner. Thanks for the lovely stream. They're always great. It'll be available later. You can see if I dunk it or not. Yeah, so this is interesting. You have new friendship and old friendship. Both Diplomat only. Old Friendship is plus five on an influence check or plus four to a corruption. I don't know why you would... Is there anything better about the new Friendship? I'll put them both down, but I, I don't... I just can't see why you'd ever play one over the other. We're almost through the biggest stack of cards for what it's worth. Pledge of Conduct is also awesome. That's interesting. Basically, if, if Frodo was facing a corruption check, he could ditch the ring to Sam. Smeagol saying, if you want to dunk, you don't need the direct influence for factions. That's correct. What were some of the other cards? Uh, it's Stealth. Stealth was one. I like that. They're both scouts. Test 
test of form. I feel like that's necessary, especially if we're not playing Gandalf. It's the only way to test a ring. Test of lore. Hmm. Test of lore subtracts one from the results, which I feel like is worse. The cock crows cancels a troll attack. That's funny, because the sun comes up. <laughs> That's hilarious. The Evan Star. Nope. Three golden hairs. That's good art on three golden hairs. How useful is thorough search here? Tab a scout, allow another character in his company to play an item normally found at its current site. I guess that, that could be useful if I end up wanting to like play several items at the same site. Trickery, it's another cancel. There's a ton of cancels in this game. Isaac asking, would you ever stream or play the Lord of the Rings LCG? Just got into it and love it. Yeah, definitely. It's on the list. Smeagol saying, not too useful. You might want a far side, though. I think I already, did I already pass that? Let me look. I think it's in my, like, short stack. Farsight. Sage only during the site phase of an untapped site where information is playable. Tap the sage in the site to search through your deck and choose an item that you must reveal to your opponent. The item is placed in your hand and the play deck is reshuffled. The sage makes a corruption check. That is interesting. If I, if I need to get a specific thing out. It's a good call. All right. Like. Wizard's test. Test a gold ring, make two rolls, and choose one result for the test. Wizard makes a corruption check. That's really good. Ah. Why is everyone recommending Glorfindel as my second company? I've seen that, that come up several times. Besides the fact that he's just awesome. And maybe that's just it. Okay. So I have a ton of cards. I feel like, <laughs> Smeagol says, it's because Glorfindel's the biggest dude around. That makes sense. He's just a big body to basically protect, protect my hobbits. All right, so I'm going to stack these in uh, in a certain kind of way. Halfling strength is a corruption check boost. A friend of three is a corruption boost. Uh, let's see. Halfling Stealth is a cancel. Concealment is a cancel. Dark Quarrels is technically a cancel. So 
Thorough Search is a tutor. Stealth is a cancel. Master of Esgaroth is movement. Master of Wood is kind of region, regional base. Uh, trickery is also a cancel. It's a big stack of cancels. Um, old Friendship is a corruption boost. Farsight kind of is in the same lane as Thorough Search. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like that's where I'm arriving to, Hermie. It says you can basically go two ways, Zach. Either just hobbits with a ton of cancels or lots of big characters to protect the hobbits and fight whenever you meet. Huh. So the big characters, I assume they would all hang out together. Interesting. Let me just cruise through the characters. Because you guys are all recommending Glorfindel. So I'm going to pull him out just so I can look. Glorfindel is an 8 prowess and a 9 body. He is beast mode. Herman saying, or I guess a third way, if you go halfway between the two. My only pause with Glorfindel is thematic. But, you know, here we are. Who are other big characters worth considering? Thranduil is pretty big. Ooh, Boromir, that's fun. For obvious anti-thematic reasons. Bjorn, also apparently a big big bear. Let me look at Boromir. I like Boromir a lot. Bjorn is big. Baragon looks cool. Where you at, Bormir? <laughs> He's not good for corruption checks, I'll say that much. Denethor's art actually looks pretty stellar. How are Legolas and Gimli? Because that could be fun. Smeagol saying Gimli is great. Unfortunately, Legolas, not so much. Yeah, 
Nick Nicholas Gardner saying Legolas is Matt Eladan and Elro here, uh, or cost efficient or are cost efficient orc fighters, plus the rangers and warriors. I mean, I like Glorfindel. Look at Glorfindel. He just looks awesome. I'm going to keep just going through and seeing if there's any art really calling my name. I feel like every time I do this, it's uh, I'm understanding this game on a very different level, which is good. I think we're going to go Glorfindel. So he's an 8. Sam and Frodo together are 9. That's 17. I technically have 3 more points, to 3 more mine to start with. So let's go look through characters that could pair here. Everyone's saying he's a beast. There's the classic Annalena. I feel like Annalena probably gets played a lot. Just because of her stats. Like, for three cost, uh, a three-eighth as a scout sage is a very useful tool. Bard Bowman. He's okay. And Glorfindel's plus one direct influence gets elves, which means he can control someone like Annalena. Ever, Nick saying, yep, she's my vote. She's a cheap uh, scout sage. It's going to be hard to beat, especially because she's an elf. You know, there's like Baragond, though. He's a two in influence, so Glorfindel could immediately influence him. Uh, also an eight body. Minus one to his corruption checks, not bad. Yeah, I just have a feeling it's going to be Annalena. Who is Annalena? I, I don't remember her being even referenced in the, in the books. I can also see Eowyn. She's only two, so he could, he could influence. Good against Nazgul if they come out. But her stats are just worse than Annalena. She's not even worth a point. It's always Faramir. So he's got a he's a better fighter. Technically he would give me the Ranger cards as well. Thomas says she's not in the books, read the quote. The gift of the elf minstrels who can make things of which they sing appear before the eyes of those that listen. All right, let's go with Annalena. So now we're going to make Glorfindel awesome. He needs some, some stuff, right? Where is it at? Items. So what weapon? What weapon should I be looking to get on old Glorfindel? And I guess it's a sword of some kind. Smeagol's saying minor item weapons don't help him. Probably because he's already, he's like going to hit the cap. Uh, 
All right, so he's already maxed out, so I don't need to waste my time with it. So it's really just gold rings. And he, where did Alien go? So they're Sage and Scout and Warrior. So, Like the magic ring of stealth going on Annalena is pretty good. Okay. I'm liking this so far. Uh, and I get two minor items to start the game as well. So Elven Cloak seems pretty good. Particularly if I end up playing Master of Wood, Water, or Hill. Smeagol's saying, Elven Close, Cram, and Healing Herbs. Let me look at, I know, I think I have Cram in my short stack here. Is that a minor item? Looks like it. Cram, discard to untap bear. Alternatively, discard during organization phase. Allows bear's company to play an additional region card. It's not bad. What was the other one? Healing herbs? I got you, Bryce. I'm not gonna have card pops for a second, but it's cool. So healing herbs say, the bear can tap and discard this item to heal a character in his company, changing the character's status from wounded to well and untapped. Alternatively, the bear can tap and discard this item to untap a character that is not wounded. Those, are, those three get mentioned a lot as like starting items. Should I be boosting my hobbits at all? I have Sting, so that potentially goes on uh, Mr. Frodo. Giving him plus two prowess, which would be three. Still not very much. Usually not worth it, okay. So, let's look at what we got going on here. Are there any permanent events I should be playing? That's a point category I would like to score in. When I Know Anything seems like a good permanent event. I didn't realize it was a point card. So it looks like you play it, it stays in play permanently, and you can tap Sage to modify a corruption check by plus three. I mean, that seems pretty good at the end when I'm trying to dunk the ring, right? Any thoughts on When I Know Anything? And I think we've pretty much made it. I'm gonna have to cut some stuff. I don't have a faction yet. Are there any factions uh, that Glorfindel is really good with? Let me look and see if I can find it. Because he's an elf. I also had Mithril Coat floating around somewhere earlier.
Smiggle saying dunk next year's got all in and trying to dunk. Wizard, when I know anything, is an example of that, right? Let's look through the factions really quick. All right, let's look. I really do think it's going all in on the dunking, the dunk NATO. So here's the question though, like if I'm gonna have a blocker, is something like Dodge way better now? So that someone like Glorfindel can block twice or can not tap to block? Smeagol saying star glass. I like star glass in general just because theme. Let's see if it's here in my stack. It's a minor item as well. Probably not the one I start with, but I'd be fine to draw into it. What's fellowship do? Nice. Fellowship is basically a plus one to prowess and corruption checks as long as your entire fellowship stays together. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Now it's time to whittle. So I'm going to slide cards this way, and then I'm going to put them up here when I'm definitely including them. So I think I need three gold rings. I can only have one, the one ring. And then I think I'm going to have to end up playing Gandalf to test rings, but I'm also going to include one of these. I think Wizard's Test is probably the best test a ring card. Because you get a roll twice. So I'm going to put Test of Form aside. Then we get our victory conditions here. Now, I feel like Gollum's Fate and Cracks of Doom are those both one ofs in a sideboard? Is that ultimately what you do? Because essentially you have your sideboard and then you can exhaust your wizard to put either five sideboard cards into your discard pile or one card shuffled into your deck as long as you have at least five cards. And I think it makes sense as well to put a test of form in my sideboard. Smeagol saying, you want smoke rings. I don't have smoke rings. Welcome to the collectible life. Can you pull up smoke rings, Rice, just so I can see it? There it is. Let's see what it says. Bring one. 
resource your character from your sideboard or discard pile into play in your play deck. Oh, that's really good. I have that card. Where do I have that card? I, I had a, a stack from another set here. Luckily, these are... Oh, there they are. Smoke rings. How many do I need? Like that. Like magic. That's a great looking card. What set is this? I think I may have all my cards from that set in this stack. Someone's saying that you might also have Leaf Brooch. Let's look. Look at the art on Ancient Stair. Woo, Ancient Stair is awesome. I'm very interested in whatever the Underdeep stuff is. Let's see if I have that old Leaf Brooch. Doesn't look like it, but maybe. There's the leaf brooch, wow. Magic. <laughs> From downtown, also, also. Look at the art on to the uttermost foundations. They don't make them like this anymore. That is something else. All right, let's look at smoke rings. Bring one resource or character from your sideboard or discard pile into your play deck and shuffle. That's super good. I don't know how many end up running, but it's got to go in. Leaf brooch, special item, only playable Lorian. If a not item must be discarded from the company of leaf brooch's bearer, you may discard leaf brooch instead. So what would get discarded that leaf brooch is so good for? I'm going to keep going while you guys answer why those two, why they're so important and how many I should be playing. Uh, so it's a, I'm looking for a 30 card deck, I believe. Uh, so I'm thinking like pro a lot of cancels, like 12. 12 seems like a lot. Concealment, definitely. Halfling strength, definitely. Smeagol saying yep to what? Ryan Rubber saying anyone else's video hitching? A mean lag. Can you guys refresh and see if it's still doing it? I feel like stealth is really good, generically. Gimmick or saying it's fine on Twitch. Uh, how do we feel about trickery versus dark quarrels? Smigo saying three smoke rings. Let's listen for now. And I'm going to do one leaf brooch. Oh, the leaf brooch can be discarded when a ring is tested. Let's just go two leaf brooches. I like that a lot. 
So let's just, let's go with nine cancels for this very second. Because I'm already at seven, 21. If we do Golem, scroll of the Sildor, that's 23. I only have seven spots left, and I have a bunch of cards over here. What do you mean, Smeagol, when you say cracks in fate can start in the SB? Site, uh, no. Okay. Um, I like Farsight particularly. Because that basically, Farsight, I can tap a Sage at an untapped site where information is playable. The Sage and the site, tap the Sage and the site to search through your play deck and choose an item that you must. Well, I'm going to try to make it through this. Uh, if you can hear me, that's great. If not, I'll at least finish the deck and then we'll probably cut out of here so we can try to figure out whatever's going on. All right. So... I think I'm just going to stick with one uh, Corruption Booster because ultimately I need that card in my hand. Actually, this is where Sideboard is actually super important, especially with Smoke Rings. Um, I'm going to leave these in the deck because Halfling Strength is generically good. Uh, but then I'm probably going to put uh, like an Old Friendship or a Friend of Three in my sideboard so that if I end up with the other cards in my hand but I need a Corruption Booster, I can use Smoke Rings to put it into my deck. Smeagol saying uh, Dark Quarrels might be slightly better than Trickery, but it, opinions differ on it. Gimmicker saying Twitch is smooth for him. It might be some sort of regional issue. Yeah, that's, that's really bizarre. All right, uh, let's see. I'm going to put in probably a Magic Ring of Stealth. Essentially, I have all these precious gold rings, and I can test them. Once I get the one ring into play, I still want those to be relevant cards. Um, let's see. I'm probably not going to go the cheap uh, travel route, so Master of Esgaroth is going to be out for now. How many am I at? Technically, that's 30, even before anything else goes in. And I think I'm fine without the rest of the cards. So, like, Thorough Search is going in my short stack. Same with Dodge and Trickery um, and Dark Quarrels. I have a, still a short stack over here. I do like Master of Wood, Water, or Hill. But ultimately, I think that's going to be... Uh, you can always put that in your sideboard, I suppose. We'll just have my entire deck over here be a sideboard if I want it for now. So I think I choose items. I really like Elven Cloak. Uh, I would like a lot more if I was playing the card I was just saying, the Master of Wood, Water, and Hill. Uh... What do we think on these minor, item minor items? Bohemian Miniature saying, I'm interested how to play the Dark Minions expansion of Fallen Wizards uh, from White Hand. I'm going to be doing that at some point. I, I definitely want to play as an Osgul, and I also want to build a Fallen Wizard deck. Smeagol says, smart sideboarding makes a good deck great. I think that's even more true of Smoke Rings. I like Smoke, smoke Rings a lot. Gimmicker saying, spoke too soon, now getting some small hiccups. Nicholas saying, I'm watching on YouTube if that makes a difference. Is it normal for you, Nicholas, or is it also being weird for you? Who knows? I feel like all the streaming technology is tied together with duct tape. For real, though. It, it feels like everything about streaming is like one, one push away from falling over. Looks like Mithril Coat didn't make it in. 
technically staying in when I know anything aren't there either. I like these cards a lot though, so they're going to get in there. Ryan saying it hasn't hiccuped in a minute. That's good. YouTube might be working again. Because there's normally 30 cards that aren't your minor items, your characters, your wizard. Is that correct? I think Cram is probably one of my items. As much as I like Star Glass, I think it's going to go away. And Healing Herb. So we're going to go Elven Cloak and Cram. Cram on Sam, Elven Cloak on Glorfindel or Annalena. Uh, Smeagol saying, do you have a favor of the Velar? Let's pull it up. I want to see what kind of what kind of card it is. Favor of Valar. Looks like it's uh, an event. Let me slide that out of the way. Doesn't look like it. Well, maybe. Is it from that same set that the leaf brooch is from? It does not look like I have it. OK, uh, let's see. I'm going to leave these out for now. So we did it. We have a 30 card deck. So it's concealment. I'm going to go through these mediumly slowly so you can pull them all up, Bryce. So it's concealment, three of. These are my Heidi cards. Halfling strength and stealth. And then. I've got my boosty card for my corruption check at the end. Corruption check is halfling strength, uh, but ultimately halfling strength uh, does a lot. It does a, a lot more than just uh, the the corruption check. So it's playable early, and then if I shuffle my deck, I'll get to see it again, hopefully. Uh, then I have my ring stuff, right? So precious gold ring times three. I'm also trying to get a ring down. And then I want to test it with a wizard's test into the one ring. And then I basically have leaf brooch so that when I discard the gold ring to try to get the one ring into play, I can discard this instead. It'll give me some extra chances if I need it. Uh, then I also have far sight which I can play with a sage at where information is playable. I tap the sage and the site to search my deck for a car, an item. So that'll let me find the leaf brooch. It would also let me find uh, the one ring. It also lets me find the precious gold ring. Uh, so I can just get those exactly when I need it. I also have a few other items. I have a scroll of Isildur. Isildur, uh, when a gold ring is tested, and this is present, the result is plus two. So I learned from his mistakes, presumably. I also put in a one magic ring of stealth. It's worth three points, which is notable. But uh, basically, if I'm testing those gold rings and I get the one ring out, it just gives me something else to do. 
Uh, it gives the bear a scout skill. They already have scout. Most of my characters have scout. Uh, everyone but Glorfindel. They can uh, tap the ring to cancel a strike against it. Uh, can't be duplicated. So that's just an extra cancel built in. I also have three smoke rings. And specifically these uh, let me bring a resource or character from my sideboard uh, or discard pile into play into my deck. And there's a lot of cards that I would want to do with this. Um, so like Golem's Fate and Cracks of Doom specifically. Those are cards you, you don't want to draw until the end of the game. And uh, ideally I get down to like, you know, a couple of cards in my deck and I can play Smoke Rings. Normally you can tap your wizard to get a card from your sideboard and shuffle it into your deck if you have five or, five or more cards. Smoke Ring doesn't have that requirement. So you could have two cards in your deck, play Smoke Rings. You know one of those three is going to be Golem's Fate or Cracks of Doom. Depends on which, which angle you're going. So that's particularly good. And I'm sure it's like super, super good in other instances as well. And of course I have Golem. Uh, Golem, two points. So he's a unique playable at Goblin Gator Moria. If his company size is less than three, probably won't be. Then you can, but it could be. You can cancel an attack against his company to Wilderness, like if it's just him and Frodo floating around. Uh, otherwise, uh, the tap ability is something I wouldn't use unless um, unless I was playing against someone who also had a, a ring bearer in play. Uh, and then my starting company, right, is Sam and Frodo. Sam, Sam Gamgee. Uh, he gets plus three on his. Corruption check, so if something happens to, to Frodo, he can make the ring check. Frodo is plus four in his corruption checks, so he's really good at dunking the ring, as you might expect. Uh, they're going to start with Cram. And then I also have uh, Annalena, who's my classic uh, scout sage elf. She's good for playing those stealth cards to cancel attacks. And then Glorfindel II. Uh, he has an extra influence against elves, so he has that hand with a two in it. It's three which means he can directly control Annalena, which is pretty good. He also has an Elven Cloak, so it's a free tap. So we go saying it's a short event from the base set, so I should have it. Let me just make sure it's not my short stack here. Favor of the Valar. I feel like I've seen that card floating around somewhere. It's not my stack. Is it over here? Retro Daniel saying, just arrived. This game looks large for a card game. It's got this map, uh, which is super helpful and also super awesome. Uh, but not, not strictly necessary. All right, let me look here. How's the, uh, how's the stream at this point? Is it still glitchy? I'm a little, little bit nervous about that. And Smeagol says, Tookish Blood is often included in the hazard portion of the deck. Can you pull that up, Bryce? Tookish Blood? Oh, this, I remember this. Oh, goodness. Nicholas saying, if somehow Frodo and Sam and Golem get separated, Golem still works because hobbits count as half party members. They're halflings. So they only count towards, like your hazard limit is usually how many people are in your party and hobbits count as half. So Frodo, Sam, and Gollum, their party count is two because it's Gollum plus the two halflings, uh, which I think is, is fantastic. John K saying, uh, Twitch seems good to him. Thomas saying, not glitchy on YouTube anymore. Nicholas saying, welcome to the 90s card game era. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so looking at uh, the deck and whatnot, uh, unfortunately, it, it took longer than I expected to get here, and so uh, we're, I, I don't want to get halfway into a, the game of dunking the ring and then not be able to finish. Um, so I'm going to take this chance. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out, and we're going to the main shot, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to play any. I, I have a little bit of time, but not, I don't think it's nearly enough to actually dunk the ring. 
Um, so what I'm thinking is I've built the deck, which is cool, and I'll be able to label the video as such. But then next time, I'm pretty sure in the next like four to six weeks, uh, there's another Thursday where Steven's gone and I'm not. And when that happens, uh, instead of deck building the entire time, I'll probably play the entire time. I have the Aragorn deck still built and I have the Dunk deck built now. I'll, I might try to get one more deck built and then try to get two or three games in in a single stream just to kind of have a very gameplay focused uh, stream. Nicholas said, smooth streaming. Thank you. So what do you guys think? Are there any cards I should look at between now and when I actually play uh, at potentially acquiring? I'm glad I found those leaf brooches and smoke rings. Smeagol so saying, stream's holding up, but there might be a slight delay. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious what that's all about. It could have just been a YouTube thing or a, a, a streaming thing in general right then for a minute. Thomas saying, let's do it then. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to play. There's a lot of decks I wanted to build, and it's that it's that kind of push and pull um, where when you're streaming all the time, and a lot of times the only time I'm getting to really look at this game is when, when I'm streaming, uh, you want to build so you can have new decks to play, but you also want to play. So you sometimes get caught up. As, I think the deck building process is super enjoyable, but at the same time, it takes a long time. Like, like I said, it's an intricately woven uh, piece of fabric when you're putting these together. So... I would like to have a bunch of decks built so I can just play, and I'm looking forward to getting to that point. Smeagol saying, uh, allies don't count for company size. So Sam and Frodo are one together. That's awesome. Sam Frodo plus Glorfindel with Golem still counts. Is that what you're saying? Waiting to see if that's it. Yep, that's how that works. Thanks, Kenobi, for confirming that. That's fantastic. Well, I'm super excited because I uh, my checklist was definitely an Aragorn deck, then a Sam Frodo Dunk deck, which I feel like we've built here. Um, I'm also looking to build a Fallen Wizard deck, a Witch King deck. Um, I'll probably do Saruman as a Fallen Wizard just because it's too, it's too easy not to do that. Uh, and then... What were the other ones on my list? I want a Legolas Gimli deck, even though you guys say Legolas isn't so good. Uh, I probably want a Hobbit-style deck, so Bilbo and the, the dwarves of sorts going to go deal with Smog. And then I feel like there are a couple others that I was interested in building. Oh, yeah, the Eowyn and uh, Mary uh, team in some form. I might do a, because it, it's thematic, Eowyn and Mary and then Faramir and Pippin and have them basically be two separate parties because Faramir and Eowyn obviously also end up together. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of decks I want to build for this game and going through and just seeing all these cards in this art, it gets me excited every time. If, if the pandemic weren't happening right now, I feel like this is a game I would be finding one or two people to play with and I would be playing a lot because if, I feel like if, if I could just jam 10 or 15 of these games that like, I would start to appreciate it just like most games I've ever been into on uh, a totally new level. Laruk, Laruk. Keiju saying chaos bag for Innsmouth conspiracy is going to be bonkers 20 plus tokens 20 tokens plus blessings and cursings in the bag I'm excited I'm going to be doing an unboxing of that uh, Innsmouth box tomorrow the player cards at least so I'm excited to see see what all it's doing we won't do the scenario for that for any any time in the near future because we don't want to spoil what's going on in it but I'm excited I'm excited to play it Smigo says wizards river horses for sideboard might be good that, that's in my short stack I, li I love that scene in the uh, the movie where the, the water's rushing through and it, it looks like horses. And it, I feel like the art was similar here. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yep, Wizards River horses. I'll go ahead and put it in the sideboard. Nazgul events are discarded or cancels an attack against a wizard if he's the only character in the company. Uh... So that just helps against Nazgul. Hmm. Thomas saying, that's what's so good about this game, all the different ideas you can do. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it's just kind of an open book, no pun intended. Um, there's just so much and it's, it's so amazing because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I've been playing tabletop games since the 90s as a kid. And to have a game that 
is just this. It's it's a it's a, there's certain crosshairs that it's hitting, um, where the art is just fantastic in its own way. The game is fantastic in its own way, and there's a ton of content already out there. Um, to to be able to discover that 25 years later is just uh, it's so unexpected, honestly, and it's it's so awesome. All right, I'm gonna do one last round of uh, thoughts or questions from anybody. We can get out of here, Bryce. I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna pop any more cards up, so you can feel free to do your thing. Um, but yeah, this has been great. I, I every time I I put my head down and build a deck for this game. Last time I did it with the Aragorn, um, the game gets a little clearer to me, and e every time, even when it wasn't super clear, it's been super enjoyable. It, it is the right level of like density for me. And I'm, I think I'm, it's because I'm committed and I'm willing, because it's Lord of the Rings, to really walk through the process. But like it is, it is scratching a deck building uh, itch that I haven't, haven't had in a long time. Ryan's saying, super sad you don't have time for a game. Yeah, I, I just feel like it would be so much worse to get about halfway through a game. I, so, you know, I don't know how long the solo game is going to take, but like, if I got halfway through a game, it would be super bummer. Uh, Romulo is saying, have you ever thought about following the actual book adventure or does it need a ton of cards? Um, I mean, so the way I set up solo mode, people were asking earlier, and if I, I haven't posted that, I'll try to do that this week. But I basically have it where things can key off of certain uh, region types. And so you could technically build any deck you wanted and last time I did Aragorn and Arwen, and like it was very thematic what was going on. I didn't have the whole Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, story happening. But they also have like there's this book. They have books for the various sets. This is from the first set, the Middle Earth, the Wizard's Companion. Um, and I think one of the scenarios in here, let me find it, is actually just the Destroy the Ring. They have a bunch of scenarios in it. There's there and back again. Uh, I'm sure that's the Bilbo and the Hobbit. There's the fate of Isildur's Bane. This is the one. Which is, uh, you know, destroying the ring. Kaoni saying, we've been playing the Art of Variant two or three times a month for the past few months on TTS. Open invitation for you to join us if you want. <laughs> I may take you up on that at some point. TTS is a big barrier for me, but I did download it to play Flesh and Blood recently. Um, so the, where was I just reading? The Art of Variant, that, I was looking at that as well on uh, basically a way to play uh, solo slash cooperative. Which I dig. I think it's really cool. Um, but the one I, the way I built the, the solo version I've played so far it just kind of creates an open world environment where you can do whatever you want. And it's really just sparring practice for me to be able to put together the free people side of a deck and play it, figure out my site pass and where I'm going and what I'm doing. And then eventually I'll upgrade to building the basically shadow side of my deck, which I'm excited to do. All right. Looks like uh, the MVPs at home set this up for me to just click a single button, which I'm excited about. It's been a great time. I really enjoyed this. Like I said, I'm, I'm looking to get back on stream at some point in the not so distant future to try to dunk the ring, as it were. And uh, I'll even try to have another deck built by then so we can play a couple games uh, in, the, in the same stream. Appreciate everyone out there for all the advice and the help and card recommendations. It's been absolutely uh, unbelievably helpful, even just asking questions like on the Golem, Golem interaction to tap and it's an optional thing. Uh, super helpful. You guys are all the best. If, uh, uh, really, it, it's been fantastic, and to get to do this is amazing. Uh, shout out to all the content members out there. You're a big reason that we can stream five days a week and also stream content like this that really, uh, you know, a year ago, if you had told me uh, so many things about 2020, I wouldn't have believed you, but particularly uh, that I would, when I was looking at actually buying the Middle Earth CCG, that we would have streamed it a handful of times and that people would have been interacting like they have been on the live streams. I wouldn't have believed it. And I feel so, so fortunate that they were able to do that. And the, the entire team's grateful for all the content members. Anyone that's a subscriber or buying, uh, you know, components from us, or when I say subscriber, also on YouTube, but uh, on our website to any of the games that we do sell and support, 
a uh, major shout out to you as well. Uh, without you guys, we, we really wouldn't be able to do any of this. So props to all of you. Thanks for being here. The kind words that are happening uh, in the chat are great. Unwound asking, please post your solo variation. I will. I'll, I'll get that up and we'll post a social link whenever, whenever that's up. If you're looking at this game and thinking about checking it out, I cannot recommend it enough. Even just deck building, the game outside the game, as it were. We talk about that a lot on the podcast. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that, we do a weekly podcast called The Covenant Cast. Uh, anyways, the game outside the game is super fun. The game itself is fun. I'm very much looking forward to being able to play this in person and hoping to have a few decks together at some point in a not-so-distant future, at like a Gen Con or something, when there are a bunch of people around that play this game. Uh, so I'll, I'll definitely be doing that. Uh, thank, thank you again. The kind comments coming in are just uh, super fantastic. Anyways, we're going to get out of here. I appreciate you. Uh, stay safe out there and uh, catch us again. Again, I will be playing this on a future Throwback Thursday at some point. We feature new old games. New, well, how would you even say that? Every week on Thursday, we throw back to old games. So if you like watching old 90s and 2000s and 2010s games getting played, check us out on Thursdays. Uh, Smigo saying, come to Europe for uh, next year's MECCG Lure. If I can come to Europe, I would think about it. Anyways, you guys have a great one, and I'll see you later.